Good morning, ladies. I'm glad that you could join us today. Um, this is really different having people from all over the place uh, come and be with us, and I hope that something that I say today will help apply uh, these truths to your life. We start out each week with a prayer, and I will do that now. Please pray with me. <clears throat> Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. You change times and you change seasons. You remove kings and you set up kings. You give wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. You reveal deep and hidden things. You know what is in the darkness and the light dwells within you. To you, O oh God, my fathers, I give thanks and praise. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. The steadfast love of you endures all the day. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid, because what can flesh do to me? Dear Lord, we ask humbly that you rid this earth of this virus. We ask you now for relief. Continue to remind us that this life is not about us, but about what we can do for you. Teach us to live unselfishly. Be with us today as we study from your words and help us to gain understanding from your servant Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. Just so you know, um, that prayer today came from Daniel 2, verses 20 through 23, Psalms 51, verse 10, verse 16, and verse 17, Psalms 52, verse 1, Psalms 56 verses 3 and 4. Um, I just thought sometimes there is no way that I can describe what I want to say in a prayer better than words from Daniel and words from David and um, the servants that lived so long ago. So I decided to use those today. We are in Matthew 13 and last week we talked about the parable of the sower. At the end of that lesson um, we realize that our job is to sow seeds. Um, we're, we're not even responsible for the growth of it all, of, of the yield of it all. Our job is simply to sow seeds. Um, and so that brings us to the next parable. Jesus is on a roll. He's giving lots of parables, um, teaching people. And it's the parable of the weeds. And it begins in chapter 13, uh, verses 24 through 30. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read um, this parable that Jesus gives. And then I'm going to skip to when he gives the explanations. And those verses for the explanation are 36 through 43. I would love to tell you the explanation of this parable, but it's great because Jesus gave it to us. And so his, he's going to do it far better than I could do it. So beginning in verse 24 of chapter 13, <clears throat> Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where, then, did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Verse 36. Then he left the crowd and he went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. 
and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. So we're just going to do those together. First of all, I want to say, normally, <clears throat> well, Matthew. Matthew uses the word, the words, kingdom of heaven, 31 times, all right? Most of the time, it is referring to, the kingdom of heaven is referring to the church, the New Testament church. That's us, okay? Most of the time. In this particular parable, the word kingdom is used three times, and all three times, it has a different meaning. It's not always referring to the church. And as we go along, I'll explain that just a little bit more. So, um, just so you know that. <clears throat> He's going to right off the bat tell us that the field is the world, okay? And so, right from the very beginning, you know that the church and the world coexist together. We will be coexisting together. We do. We know this already. Symbolically, the, feet, the wheat that is produced is Christians, okay? If the wheat is the Christians, then the weeds or the tares will be people that are worldly, all right? Uh, the servants are resting. It's night. The servants are resting. Jesus doesn't chastise the servants about resting. They had worked very hard. They had earned their rest. That was good. Okay, so he doesn't he doesn't get on to them for resting. And what he does really point out is the deceitfulness of the enemy. Because when does the enemy come to sow the bad seed? He comes at night and then he sneaks away. So it's really showing the deceitfulness, and as we know already, it's the devil, okay? What does he sow? The word tares comes from a Greek word which refers to a kind of darnel or grass, sometimes referred to as a ryegrass. Um, it is poisonous. It's a poisonous ryegrass, and, and if you consumed enough of that, it could kill you. So basically, we have the enemy coming to sow poison at night and sneaking away from it. And that shows you how deceitful the devil is. The people of Palestine could understand exactly what darnel or tares was. In fact, one commentary that I read said that it was common for a rival to sow that in someone else's uh, land or field. And I thought, well, that's just a terrible thing to do. But apparently that was a common thing and they could understand that. <clears throat> I need to tell you, if you're just tuning in now and you didn't tune in at my very first lesson, that um, one of the uh, commentaries that I use is written by a member of our congregation. His name is Lonnie Ritchie. And I refer to it, I'll say, Lonnie said this, I will refer to it and I I do believe in giving credit where credit is due. I read his commentary word for word to help me understand. I've got about four other ones that I use also. So whenever you hear me refer to Lonnie, that's who I'm referring to. Um, I have a copy of his commentaries and I read and study from them. So um, <clears throat> in early stages of this uh, tear being sown or this ryegrass being sown, it is very hard to distinguish between the two of these things. In its immature state, it isn't easy to discern the differences between those that belong to the church and those that do not. That's, that's interesting, okay? That at a certain stage, where can you begin to see the difference between those that belong to the church and those that don't? The wheat is going to sprout. It is about producing fruit. That is the difference between what I do and what someone in the world does. 
I should be producing fruit. Don't forget, I'm the one that's sowing it. I am sowing that seed. That is my responsibility. That is my job. And in a mature state, there will be fruit from that. So I found that very interesting. Um, according to the parable, the servants have no idea how this got into the field. They obviously did not sow that in the field. And they go to the owner and they say, did you sow good seed in your field? You're asking the, you know, they're asking a question. You know, did you just throw out some rye grass at the same time? Well, of course not. He didn't do it. You know, they're just kind of drawing it. And um, the owner immediately can draw his own conclusion from that. Oh, I know exactly what has happened. Um, someone has deliberately sown weeds into the field that I had prepared for seed. So it's a deliberate thing, okay? The owner is very intelligent also when the servants say, hey, we can handle this. We can go in the field. Let us go in there and pull it up. Do you want us to do this? <clears throat> Jesus, no. The owner says, no, 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 no. Um, if you try to remove the weeds now, the wheat may also be damaged in the process. We're going to wait on that. And there is a lesson there. It is not the job of the servants to make judgments about what is and isn't actual wheat. Our focus has always been to sow the seed. Our focus shouldn't be on judging the world. And why? Because Jesus says, if you're too busy judging the world, trying to pull out the sin of the world, you could damage the wheat in the process. That is not our job. Condemning others, judging others is not our job. My job is to serve the master. That's my job. I find that interesting. <clears throat> the owner says we're going to continue to let these things grow together until the harvest. When the wheat is mature and having produced what it's supposed to produce, it's ready to come out of the ground. Then we will have the separation process, okay? So Jesus, he, he's gonna explain, uh, as you know, later on he takes his, his disciples away. They go into the house where he can give an explanation. They wanna know. We wanna know what the explanation of this parable is. They're searching, okay? Um, and Jesus is going to give them a description. Um, those, Jesus will explain that the good seed that is sown by Jesus are those that become members of this New Testament church. Okay, so the very first time he uses the kingdom or he is talking about the church. That's what happens. And they are called the sons of the kingdom. The weeds, however, who are sown by the devil are known as the sons of the evil one. Okay, so we have a, we have a contrast here. We shouldn't be surprised at the way Satan works. He is deceitful. The end of the world is the day of judgment. So we get to the very end of it all, which we haven't gotten there yet, the day of judgment, and there is going to be a separation <clears throat> between the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the evil one. Who is going to harvest this? Angels. If you didn't know what one of the responsibilities of an angel is going to be, Jesus is going to give you a little insight into it. Hey, the angels are the harvesters. And notice, the angels are going to take in everybody. They take the evil ones and the sons of the kingdom all at the same time. And then they're going to separate them out. All right, so we get, we get an idea of a, of a significant role that they're going to play um, in the last days. So, um, angels are gathering. They are separating it out. Now, you need to be mindful of the word kingdom in verse 41. Here again is that the, the um, this is a different word. The, what the, the, word, the word that was used in verse 24, kingdom, was referring to the church. The one that is used in verse 41, listen to it. The son of man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. 
I believe that that word kingdom right there is referring to the world. He's He's going to take in everybody from all over the world, the entire world. So it can't possibly mean the church. This is where it gets really confusing. There are some people that believe that if the, this whole entire, entire parable is talking about church. So you've got people that aren't so good in church and people that are really good in church. And those are the people that are going to be separated out. This is not about church discipline and who's good and who's bad within our own church. It is about the world as a whole. And I think it's if you read this and you think, um, it, it sounds obvious to me that what he's talking about is the world there. Uh, the parable is going to refer to the separation that is made between righteous and unrighteous all over the world. And those in the world that serve Satan will be judged and condemned because they did not only live in sin, but they caused other people to sin. They encourage others in their lifestyle and they discourage them from following Jesus. And where do they go? It's very specific that there is a fiery furnace where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The fiery furnace can only refer to hell. And I know many people today don't want to hear that there's a heaven and there is a hell. This clearly shows that there is a hell. And what's worse than that is there is tribulation and suffering in hell. It's not a happy place. It's not a happy place. And um, it's amazing that in these parables you have so much insight into what's happening now and what's going to happen then. Okay? The others... The other people that are not going to be put into the fiery furnace, well, they're the righteous ones, and they're going to receive glory and honor. Again, the word kingdom is used. Look at verse 43, which I love. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Well, in this case, I think kingdom's referring to heaven. Again, to me, okay, if I look at this logically, that's what it's referring to. All right, so I like that. Okay, heaven. A place where righteous will go and that it belongs to the Father. Um, as members of the church, we should go out just like Jesus did and spread the seed. That was the first time kingdom was used. The devil's going to be doing the same thing. Okay, he is spreading his, his seed, only he does it in a very sneaky way. The good and the bad will grow beside each other, but one day, in the day of judgment will come, the angels will do their part by separating out the good and the bad and giving each what they deserve. Jesus will end his explanation of this parable by saying, He that hath ears, let him hear. He just means, again, pay special attention, attention to my words. Give serious consideration to this, okay? And listen, reflect meditate on this and um, come to your conclusion all right so let's move on we're going to get to the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast starting in verse 31 i'm going to read this is chapter 13 so i'm kind of going back i'm going between these um, these uh, the parable the weeds and the explanation so verse 31 <laughs> he told them another parable the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So, so was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables and I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Okay, so we get back to uh, the kingdom again. This time, both of these occasions, he is talking about church. And more specifically, he's talking about the growth of the church. The first one is, um, it's, it's dealing with the small beginnings of a church. And that's really no surprise. Everything starts small. 
it starts small and it builds, and so does the church. It's going to grow, in other words. He talks about a mustard seed. Now, I have seen a mustard seed, and it is not that small. So what is Jesus talking about that it's the smallest? If you look in Luke's account, 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 19, you find out Jesus actually uses the word garden, the smallest seed of the garden. This was common in Palestine for these people to plant a, a, a tree in their garden. And it would have been the smallest. The mustard seed would have been the smallest seed that you would plant in your personal garden kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> It was the smallest of seeds planted. The point Jesus is making is that it begins small, but then it will grow to be the largest thing in the garden. It grows to about 10 feet tall. It is big enough that birds will eat, that will live in it. And basically, this is a parable of contrast. It begins small. It grows large. So that's what he's saying about the church. <clears throat> there was no explanation for this parable. But I think it is uh, fairly easy to see that it's going to spread rapidly. In fact, the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were added that day to the church. I think it's easy to understand that it's talking about the growth of the church. <clears throat> he again then tells a parable, and this time it involves yeast. Uh, the couple of weeks ago before we, it was the very last lesson we had uh, before we couldn't have um, Bible classes in church anymore and we were talking about yeast um, if you've been tuning into any of the children's lessons um, our whole theme is about uh, bread basically it, the theme is bread but it's about how God provides for his people and every single lesson we go through the entire Bible each quarter every lesson has got to do with bread or yeast so we were talking about yeast um, on Sunday morning and I told them that it was a fungus and this didn't go over very well because they quickly figured out that pizza is made <laughs> from a dough that has yeast in it and so basically their pizza has fungus in it and I think I put them off pizza for a while but anyway we were we were talking about this and um, <clears throat> FYI in Bible times Whenever you prepared a, a loaf of bread that had yeast in it, you get it all done and you would pull off a piece of dough and put that on the cabinet or in your jar or your vessel or whatever it was and you saved it for the next time. And then you took that piece of dough and you put it in with the big piece of dough. That's how they did it. They didn't have little yeast packets that you stuck in there. They kept a piece of dough all the time. Now, granted, they were making it daily, but it's amazing that that little bit of yeast, I guess it's a little like sourdough, a little bit of yeast would work through that whole dough each time they made it, okay? So leaven in this parable, or yeast in this parable, assures us of the quickness, the quietness, and thoroughness in which the church uh, will have on the world itself, okay? It is unstoppable. Once the yeast is added, there's no taking, taking it back out again, okay? It's in there. The work of the church, it works quietly, but it works thoroughly, and it will show itself. When does it show itself? When it begins to rise. You know the yeast is working when it begins to rise. It will show itself. Uh, Jesus uses a woman. He specifically talks about a woman in this parable. And maybe people in our society would be all bent out of shape because Jesus <laughs> used a woman in this parable. And what this woman did. Uh, but this is, that's what women did. That was their work. You know, and rather than being all bent out of shape, perhaps we can relish in the fact that Jesus gave due diligence to the gender that did this kind of work. I think there's two ways to look at things always. I think it's fantastic that Jesus used a woman in this parable. You know, I think it's great. What does yeast do for bread? It improves it. I would much rather have a piece of bread that has yeast in it than without. I really would. And uh, There's no doubt uh, about that. But the church and the way it works in society also improves society. Yeast improves bread, 
the church improves society. Think about the impact that a church can have on its community. It works just like yeast. You know, it, it's, it's quick, it's quiet, it's thorough, it shows itself each time. Our values and morals socially improve our society. I think that's a, a beautiful thing. So at the end of these two short parables, Jesus will give his reason and purpose for teaching the way that he did. We know that Jesus spoke in other ways. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus didn't always speak in parables. So why would Matthew say, well, Jesus always spoke in parables? It's because at this point, Jesus was. This particular time and this event, when he is doing all these parables, he spoke everything to them in parables at this time. So um, he used those. Uh, Matthew has a tendency to divide his books into sections. We have his Sermon on the Mount. We have all we have all these healings, and now we're having all of these parables. It's kind of put in there like that. So the prophecy that's referred to here is a quotation from Psalm 78. Uh, we believe that that was um, an Asaph. Asaph uh, was written by Asaph. Asaph was a seer. We find that out um, in Second Chronicles 29 verse 30. He was with David. He was a seer to David, okay? And apparently, he was known to teach in parables just the way Jesus did. Um, Jesus is going to use parables to convey these truths and revelations to his people, so he is fulfilling what Asaph said. Um, and history has distinguished Jesus as a teacher of parables. Everybody knows when you talk about a parable, it was Jesus that taught in parables. You know, he's going to become a master storyteller, which is which is fantastic. Uh, so, Jesus is teaching in parables, and now we get to the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl, which we're going to start in verse 44. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field where a man found it. He hid it again, and then in his joy he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. Okay, so um, I believe that Jesus is now speaking privately to his, his uh, disciples, okay? And the other parables were having to do with church and the growth of it and the way that it spreads. And now Jesus is going to tell us about its worth. Okay, so again, he's talking about church and he's talking about the worth of it. Uh, a man finds something that is hidden and it has great value. And this was not uncommon. Um, this was a land that was plagued by war. It was plagued by thieves. Maybe a good safe place for a treasure was hidden in the ground. Okay, and that was the best place to deposit a treasure. The current owner of this property did not know it was there, obviously. All right, the field became valuable or very valuable when the man found it. He found it and he knew there's treasure that is contained there. And so all of a sudden it has value. In his joy, he goes, he sells everything in order to buy this field. Possession cost everything, but cost is no object since it is his joy that motivates him. Whatever we think is valuable is worth the purchase of this one thing. To belong to the church is more valuable than our most valuable possession. You think about that for a little while. This parable may also illustrate that some find the church without actually looking for it, but when they discover the advantages to be gained by being in, in it, they realize its great value. So many times I think the church is made up of people, and after a while, you start taking advantage of, taking for granted, not advantage, taking for granted these people that you have. Of all the times in my life, not being able to be 
with my church family has shown me how very valuable they are. And I miss them. Maybe this is God's way of teaching the value that we have for one another and the love that we have for one another. It's valuable. This, we all have a, a goal, one goal in mind. We're all striving for that goal. And a lot of times we need to learn to overlook uh, each other's faults and, uh, and learn to value the fact that um, we have just one thing in common and that's to glorify and honor God the Father and be with Him forever. And so it has taught me the great value of that. Um, Jesus tells another parable, only this time it's a pearl that has the value. The differences in these two parables is that the first guy found it by accident, but this second guy is diligently looking. Okay, so you've got two people here. He is a merchant of pearls. He too will discover the value of this and he wants to attain it. He is also willing to pay a high price for it. A character trait of the church is its rarity. It is rare. It's not on every street corner. It's not showy and it's not common. We are different, unique, and rare. But it's very valuable and it's very precious. Uh, parable of the net. Try to finish this. Uh, verse 47. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but they threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. And he said to them, Therefore every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storerooms new treasures as well as old. Okay. In this parable, the church is the net. And it catches all kinds of people. It is the nature of a dragnet not to discriminate. Um, one of our earlier lessons, we talked about what a dragnet was. Um, it had weights on the bottom of it that would sink down. This one on the top floated to the top. And you had one guy on one side and one guy on the other side, and they would sweep that net across, and it took in everything, whatever was there. You know, um, It's a mix of all kinds of fish. It's including a mix of trash. You know, whatever is there is what gets pulled up, get, gets pulled in. The church is the same way. We bring in good. We bring in bad. We bring in useful. We bring in useless. We have all kinds of, of things that are brought in. We cannot distinguish between, we've talked about this, distinguish between what is brought in and what isn't. We have the opportunity to spread. We're just the dragnet. We're just going to drag it all in, okay? Um, and there's usually two different views of the church. Um, church people are good, fully committed, quite different from the world. Another view of the church is that we are sinners, we are hypocrites, and we look a lot like everybody else. My view is that we're a little of both because we're human. We are both. I have a children's story that I read to my children. It's the secret of Henry and Sam. Henry was this kid that did everything perfect. He, he picked up his room, he fed his pets, he listened to mom and dad, he was good to babies and elderly people, he was just fantastic. But Sam, on the other hand, he forgot to put his clothes up, he threw them everywhere, he forgot to feed his pets, he sometimes took toys away from babies and made them cry. It's just the saddest story about poor Sam. And at the very end he says there's a secret between Henry and Sam. He says, I'm both of those guys. I thought that was really interesting. He's both of those people. The New Testament church is made up of all kinds of people. 
we are, it's made up of all kinds of humans that are bound to make mistakes. And Jesus is saying that there will be a time when we will be separated out and sent to our designated places. The job will not and shall not be done by us. It is in God's hands. Our job is to gather anyone and everyone in that will listen. And leave God to his job and leave us to ours. Uh, when Jesus finished, he asked his disciples, Do you understand this? And they answered, Yes, we understand. Jesus had given them the interpretation. So yes, they understood. Jesus also said in verse 12 that those who had would be given more. And that was why they understood. Okay. Goes back to that verse. If you want to know bad enough, you're going to know. If you're seeking a treasure, you're going to find it. Um, on the other hand, there are those that did not. Um, Jesus ends by talking about a scribe, um, anybody that was a teacher of the word. And he is like an owner of a house. He sets his table for the guest and he brings things in from his storehouses. Some things he brings from his storehouses are old and some things he brings from his storehouses are new and fresh. And his point was that any teacher can use things from their past to teach. And, many, and teachers can use new experiences to teach also. It helps keep the attention of the guests. He studies to make things fresh and challenging. He may use an old illustration again and again, but he brings new things into that same lesson. The things that we study are like a treasure house, and it is meant to be shared with other people. I'm at the end of what I have prepared today. We will pick back up there next week. Maybe in a couple of weeks, I will actually be in ladies' Bible class, and um, maybe possibly we can continue to do it there. I want to leave you with a scripture today rather than a song, and just listen to the words of this. You will recognize it. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and I surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Because love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, and it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And honor one another above yourselves. I hope that you have benefited from something we've said today. And I hope you'll join us again next week. Thanks so much.